My name is Justin Damore. Um, for those of you that have uh, heard me speak before, uh, I'm sorry. For those that haven't, you'll understand what I'm talking about shortly. So for your safety, we've locked the doors so you can't escape. Um, today we're going to talk about uh, some different technologies. I'm actually representing a couple different companies and technologies and things that uh, I believe in. And the reason that we're doing it this way and didn't break up the next two sessions are because a lot of what I'm going to talk about today are, are tools for the toolkit in solving a specific problem. There's one thing you're not going to find in any of these presentations today, and that is the word wastewater. And it's a term that we don't use in any of our companies, uh, and that is because we don't waste any water. Water is going to be a commodity uh, in our lifetimes and something that is very important. And using the word wastewater is a stigma that leads it to be something nasty or something that, that we want to get rid of. And we want to transform it. We want to get into water reuse. We want to think differently uh, about what we're doing. So a little bit about Anua as a company. Anua was owned by Borden Amona, uh, which is a company owned partially by the Irish government. Uh, we purchased it about a year and a half ago on a U.S. entity from Rochester, New York, uh, which fully owns now the factory in North Carolina. Uh, we're a solutions provider. We have many different technologies, but we provide our email addresses and our personal phone numbers uh, for all of our staff, all the way up to our government relations division, so that we can hear about what you guys are doing in the field and how we can make that better and how we can solve a problem and how we can bring clean water back to the environment. Um, the important part of all this is working together as a community. And I see a lot of people sitting here today that, uh, you know, for me, New York, I used to live in Inlet, New York, uh, and in Rochester, New York. And it's important to me, uh, growing up in the Adirondacks and in the Finger Lakes and Canandaigua, and understanding uh, as a septic pumper, where I started my career driving a, a septic truck, and seeing what really happens in this industry from the ground up, uh, I have a lot of uh, revere for all of you to choose to be the experts, to choose to give up your day today to come here and learn about things that normally people wouldn't take the time out of their day to try to understand. And the group of people in this room, installers, residents that have showed up, engineers, designers, distributors, whatever your field is, we are all the first line of defense when trying to understand what a customer needs. Most of the time when they are confronted by a problem, they don't really know what that problem is, and it has a spousal acceptance factor of about zero, which means poop in your yard is not a new kitchen. It is not a new car. It is not a flat screen TV. It is something that a client wants taken care of and out of their way for the least amount of money possible in the quickest time frame that we can possibly do. And everyone in this room has a challenge. As engineers, we have to understand the site. We have to understand what the site needs. As regulators, we have to understand what the state codes are and what the law is and how to work with the engineer to get the best possible system that we can there to treat the water. As a homeowner, we need to understand when we find out that it's a three bedroom system and we have 17 people on the weekend that we need to tell our designer and engineer some of those things so that we can have a system that actually works and treats water. And we've all been there. It's been brought up today in the talks. I have a three bedroom house and I also have 45 people over on the weekend and every cousin sleeping in tents out front and using the bathroom. And I think it's more prevalent here, which is why I bring it up because we are in a vacation community. Lake George is a beautiful place. I race my sailboat every year for the past 20 years at the Lake George Club. I love it here. It's an amazing place. We want to keep it that way. <clears throat> and it's not just Lake George. It's, it's lakes everywhere. Everyone is starting to step, step up, and this is a great format. This is the most people that I have seen uh, in all my travels this year. And it, when I say that, I've been, I think, on 33 airplanes since January 1 who have actually showed up to care about a specific region. Maybe we get 15 or 20 people who want to talk about a training and a specific uh, problem that they may have, not this type of mass. So this is great, and, and you all deserve uh, a round of applause for really taking the effort to be here. So at Anua, uh, we also do air treatment. We're not going to get into that today. 
Um, it's something that we believe in. We use sustainable materials in, in everything we do, and we think differently about how we treat the water. Uh, our main product, PureFlow, which most of you have known uh, and used here for a very long time, is made from peat fiber. The peat fiber that we use comes from Ireland. Uh, we buy it from Ireland. It is a waste product. It is not something that we actually harvest from a peat bog. In Ireland, they don't use coal to power the entire country. They use peat briquettes. They compress and screen peat to make briquettes that they burn to heat their houses and power their plants. The screenings that come off that are the lignin content, the actual wood fiber, which has very good bulk density for us to be able to treat as a biological filter. We buy those leftover materials that would normally be burnt or buried in the ground uh, or thrown out from Ireland. So the great news is that all of the peat fiber that we sell in the United States, even for horticulture, is a byproduct of something that would normally be wasted. And it's the same thing with our air products. We use shells. We use seashells from the canning industry to create calcium carbonate instead of adding chemicals. We don't really want to add anything. We want to use things that are being thrown out and we want to upcycle them and give them another life. So overview a little bit on PuraFlow and what it does. It's very flexible because it's modular. There are no odors from it. It has very low power requirements and we'll talk about all these things. Seasonal or intermittent use is very good and it's because it's only using water when it needs to be using water and since the peat stays moist and it is a biological actual uh, harboring ground for microbial assimilation, you have a lot of bugs and other creatures, higher life forms that live in there. So if it's not used for a period of time, it still is keeping that biological assimilation going. Uh, we assemble everything at the factory. I don't know why marketing put that in there. I would assume that everybody thinks they're getting a completed product. Uh, and our, we'll talk a little bit about our high nitrogen removal and pathogen, pathogen reduction. I love that word, pathogen reduction. Uh, as we talked about the green and sustainability of it uh, and why the peat fiber is so important. That's what it looks like. Um, for all the people that have used the product in the past, uh, we have redesigned our lids this year coming out in the next two weeks. So where they used to not be able to bolt together and I know people that have used them have had bowed modules and we fixed all that. It, uh, it was step one when we bought the company. So we're actually releasing our new lids which are all convex. We used to call it the bird bath because a little bit of water would pool in there. And uh, we're actually allowing now in New York a layer of mulch over the top of it. Uh, we have done testing in Texas uh, currently uh, for the past few years and the airflow is, is zero change uh, because of the amount of airflow and over aeration that we have in there with the holes we're allowing now a layer of a few inches of mulch to cover the lids uh, for people that also think the green lid has a spousal acceptance factor of zero uh, which it does so Our system requires a pump chamber and a primary septic tank. There's a reason for that. Every single product that we make to date, that we ship, requires a primary septic tank and a pump chamber. The reason for that is that we believe in time dosing. We believe in controlling the actual amount of water that goes into a known unit because we're not here to just pass an NSF test. We're not here to pass a BNQ test. We're here to pass life. And life out in the field is way different than it is at a test facility in Texas or up in Stokes, Canada. And our thought process is all about how can we reduce energy? Because we wanna know when it's using water. We wanna create and proliferate bacteria when water's not being used without using energy. So the only way to do that is to have a pump in the system. It's only one pump. We don't have complicated recirculation or anything like that in any of our products. Uh, but this basically allows us to know this is the dose that we're treating. This is the amount of media that we have. And we know that mathematical formula quite well after 23 years. Uh, the one thing that the Irish did do when uh, they were here is a ton of testing, uh, both here and in Europe. And the amount of data that we've collected and sift through to get to where we are today uh, is very vast 
and it's allowed us to actually be releasing PuraFlow this year uh, in a concrete kit that can be fully buried, which uh, is going to NSF as we speak uh, to get uh, engineered approval so that we'll have NSF 40 and 245 on that. So 23 years of testing this peat fiber. We've tested peat in the United States from Minnesota. We've gone to Canada. The problem is that we can't get the media life that we're getting now. 15 years is what we say the media lasts for. But I was just traveling in Virginia where we started 23 years ago, and there are original systems in the ground that don't look like they need a media replacement anytime soon. It's the age of the peat bogs and the type of wood in the anoxic zone that it was grown in in Ireland that allows it to have so much lignin wood content to keep the bulk density so it doesn't compress and get crushed and allow interstitial space inside the box for bacterial growth and things to happen so that we can actually treat the water. Trying some new technology. I've been trying to do this whole thing from my watch, but it wants to reject my inability to operate my own email. So, <clears throat> the other reason that uh, we use the pumps in all of our systems is so that we have a hard stop. One of the things we're doing right now is entering the water reuse market for black water in California. And we're doing a few pilot programs. And what we're starting to realize in reuse is we don't want a system that's not working continuing to push out water. So we want to be able to make sure that we're not short-circuiting anything. We don't want any gravity flow-through units that are just going to say, oh, aerator's broken. Uh, you know, one thing we see, Johnny gets home from school. There's a giant alarm going on on a box that's super annoying when he's trying to play Nintendo. There's a big button on the front that says push to reset. We go ahead and hit that. Don't tell anybody. The aerator's still broken. Water's going in and out of a unit, being sprayed all over the ground in Texas where they're doing spray dispersal while kids are running through it. It's not something we were trying to think about how do we do this inexpensively so and that was one of the main reasons that we use that we can't short circuit anything in any of our systems if it's not working system shuts off sends an alarm and actually our new system is pretty cool it sends you an email and lets you know that your system's not working Three things are big here. Uh, some systems use aeration, some systems are biofilters, some systems, uh, as Darren said, are a magic box uh, with a magician and a hat in there and a couple of card tricks. Uh, ours is based on physical, which is the actual media being a filter. Uh, chemical, where we're getting cation exchange for nitrogen reduction and specific absorption of new bacteria to bring on step three, which is microbial assimilation. Uh, the easiest way I can explain microbial uh, assimilation is we just did it at lunch. We ate a bunch of food, we masticated it, we brought it into our system, and right now our system is saying, all right, you are gonna go over to the heart, you're going over to the liver, breaking it up to where it needs to be used and absorbing it into the body. That's what a lot of the higher life forms that are living inside the peat fiber are doing, transporting these things around and creating bridging between the different colonies to strengthen the microbes that are inside the box, creating an ecosystem, an ecosystem where we can diversely handle a broad spectrum of different waste streams. This is a very complicated chart that has to deal with fecal coliform reduction. And the only reason that I bring this up because I hate lots of science when we have a short amount of time. The cool thing is that these are all the states and different people that have done testing on our fecal coliform reduction, which as you see under most cases is under 200, which is well under one log. And that's why states like Cleveland and Ohio, uh, Cleveland should be a state, uh, Ohio itself has allowed us to, uh, they actually said zero separation to the water table. I had to call them up and say, hey guys, we need a couple inches in there, right? We're not, we, somebody's gonna put it in the water table and take this the wrong way. But because they have a lot of problem uh, with the high water table and horrible soils, and they wanted something that was gonna guarantee that couldn't be short-circuited, that they could put close to the water table and be comfortable with the coliform reduction without having to go to expensive UV systems, because the biggest part of it is a lot of the areas that needed new systems 
uh, were fiscally uh, oppressed and didn't have the money to do complicated systems. So in a lot of states in Virginia, all these states started doing testing on our fecal coliform reduction uh, once we got our nitrogen reduction certification for the specific reason of reducing uh, the water table uh, and separation to that. Obviously in New York, we're never gonna get around that. It's 24 inches, that's 75A. 75A is not an approval, it's a law. So that pretty much ends that. This system, as you can see, is a full treatment and dispersal unit on pad dispersal based on Kaplan uh, right here in New York. And I actually think this is not far from here because I'm pretty sure this is a system that Emmons did uh, in the earlier days. And we see a lot of that in Lake George because there's a lot of ledge here. We all know the soil problems. It's either too fast or we have ledge and we have a complicated site where we've got to get three cranes, a pterodactyl and something else to get the system in the backyard. And this solves a lot of those problems. This is uh, a community up in Ontario uh, near Winnipeg. And they're actually just uh, the hotel down the street from this just ordered 36 units because that's the only thing that the town water keepers will allow into the actual community that close to the water. So this has been a big area for us. Uh, Georgian Bay is really starting to get interested in it in Canada uh, because there's a lot of issues, a lot of islands, a lot of rock, and things tend to pollute very quickly there. This shows recirculation uh, because we get much higher numbers in a nitrogen reduction, I believe up to 75%. Uh, we get 40% normally. Uh, we can have a recirculating system where we can load the modules a little bit more. I'm not going to get too much of design or anything today because I want to talk about these different technologies uh, briefly. If anyone wants to contact any more information, I have everything on thumb drives. You can see me or the guys at Emmons and we'll be able to hand you out everything you need to design the system or just call me on my cell phone. I'm always in the car. So, so what the module looks like, it's a distribution grid on top that pressurizes and doses 120 gallons uh, of water a day. Uh, to 150 our maximum per module. We dose it every two hours at the rate of 10 to 14 gallons uh, per dose. And if you see at the bottom uh, where those blue holes are, that is where it weeps out the bottom. And I should have showed a picture of the bottom and how it's sloped and moves the water out. Uh, we have limestone in the bottom. That's how we balance the pH before we send it back, deal with the tannins that are inside the peat. We also have a unit uh, without the holes on the bottom that you could plug into chambers should you want to do that. Already went through that one. Great. This just talks a little bit about our nitrogen reduction. We get pretty good numbers. Uh, we do a lot of stuff in Virginia and in the, for the Bay Restoration Fund, a lot of things that are happening to clean up the Chesapeake Bay. Uh, they like it because like us at Anua, we like to talk to you when you're happy. We really don't like to talk to you when you're pissed off and something doesn't work. So we really don't get a lot of calls on Puriflow. The only thing we get the calls about is the lid, which is why I spent so much time trying to redesign it. Really, that's it. Why do I have to have this ugly lid in my yard? Why can't you figure this out? Well, I figured out how to treat your water, but I just haven't figured the lid out yet. Next technology we're gonna talk about is our SBR, our sequential batch reactor. Um, this is a technology that's been around in Germany for a very, very, very long time. It's been around in the US. It's not really been tackled correctly uh, or successfully in the residential market, and that's because of the control system. The control system being the heart of any process, uh, if you don't have that right, you don't have a functioning system. So what we did is kind of start from the ground up. We bought a circuit board company uh, because we really wanted to start to get in the performance monitoring. So we really were able to start shaping how we wanted as a company to have something that really worked well. We also, uh, our design thought here was we wanted a system that didn't have a tank. We wanted a system that shipped in a UPS box within three days because as an installer, uh, in my background, I know how money works and it may stop raining and tomorrow you want to put in a system 
and you may want that system as an installer immediately within 24 hours because the weather window is good, the customer's ready to pay, and today's the day. So we wanted to be able to move these things around within three days and ship them UPS very quickly out of our factory and be put into any one septic tank in the world, period, at any time, regardless of where you are, whether it's a raw tank, an infiltrator tank, a uh, concrete tank, uh, a metal tank, like in my house in the Adirondacks before I replaced my system, an oil tank. Uh, whatever you wanted to do, that was what we decided to sit down as designers and do. So we designed this cool system that actually senses water use, which I'll get into. It actually controls itself and shuts itself down and keeps the bacteria alive through blast aeration when it's not working. It's really interesting. We do make risers uh, for the Easy Set riser system, Infiltrator and Roth, where the kit's already snapped together and you just screw it in and put the parts together. It can be assembled. Uh, if you've got your electricity run, you can assemble this in about four hours once the tanks are in the ground. This is what it looks like in a concrete tank. That is a two compartment tank with a watertight baffle. We can do it in two tanks. We do it in two tanks all the time. Uh, in this particular case, this is one tank. And here's the process. We use a primary treatment tank and we use a reactor tank. The aeration is in the reactor tank. Uh, it's a very interesting uh, aerator. It's out on the Emmons pump table right now. It does mixing and aeration at the exact same time. So it's not your normal bubble diffused uh, situation. It's a high quality, really well thought out aerator that there's some videos on our site that show how the bubble diffusion works and we're actually quite proud of it. From there we use a siphon, which means we have our sludge return pump in the reactor tank, but we have siphon holes drilled in the other end where it's returning. The reason we do that is we didn't want to add an extra pump to fill it. So we send over some water, and if it starts the siphon process, it cavitates the pump. The computer understands that water's coming in because we're cavitating, and it's moving the float. So the system will go, okay guys, time to treat water. Let's bring some water over. So it'll bring over X amount of water, and it will start the process. It's a six hour process, four cycles a day, six hours a run. Every 45 minutes it checks to see if it needs to bring over more water. The reason we do that is we didn't want to treat an entire mass of water and aerate at one time. We wanted to start the biological process with a seeded carbon source that we already have in the tank uh, from the last batch. And we want to bring over water and continue to add water that needs to be treated to water that's already been treated. Dilution is a solution to pollution. So we figured the best way to do it was not make the system work harder than it needs to work. So we're only aerating specific amounts of time during each of these 45 minute hour intervals because we want some sedimentation. We do that for a period of time and then we do a full two hour sedimentation process and then we discharge. We discharge for 20 to 30 minutes. Uh, we have modes in there for drip. I know in New York drip really isn't something that we use a lot. Uh, I don't see it a lot, but we do have that mode, low pressure distribution mode, uh, full dump to a distribution box, whatever you'd like to do, we have those modes built in there. But the power of the system really is the fact that if no one's using water in the house, the system goes into rest mode. And during rest mode, it just aerates I think it's 15 to 20 seconds every half hour to keep the bacteria there and slightly proliferating without turning it into filamentous flock or something nasty that we don't want in there. And the reason for that is we know people don't shut the unit off. And if there's a timer on that unit or something we can adjust to 10 minutes an hour or whatever you want, we know that they're going to do that. And when they leave their house for the week and come back, they're not going to take the time to shut the system off because they've forgotten about it. It's installed and really they don't remember till October when they're shutting the house down and they have to remember to call the service provider to do the NSF service. So we wanted the system to keep the bacteria alive, not use any energy, 
not over aerate because over aeration is just as bad as under aeration. So we really like to just keep the bacteria where it needs to be to be alive. The other thing it does is if we have the 50 people on the weekend, the system goes into a mode before the high water alarm call, uh, comes on called party mode. And party mode basically changes all the aeration cycles and discharge cycles to speed everything up. So we bring over more batch, we start shortening, we go from four to five cycles, and we'll take more water in the beginning and aerate, and we'll aerate for a longer period of time. Because what we don't want to do is have water that's not treated. So the cool part of it is that it senses under and overuse and adapts to those. And once the water level goes back down, the system goes back to normal and checks itself and checks itself every half hour for water usage. So if someone's not home for a week and they come, it only take about half an hour before they get there to get going. Our bacterial startup at NSF was uh, under 11 days. I think in one, in one annex we had six and the other we had uh, eight days. So we, we definitely start up pretty quickly. Uh, we can seed it if it needs to be started that day. Uh, we've done a lot of testing with dog food, which actually works very well, and we can assist you in that should you need a faster bacterial startup. This kind of just shows how it's plumbed together, and you'll see the kit in a minute. We spent a lot of time. We had uh, really fancy uh, holding units for all these pumps, and we had this floating orb disc with everything mounted to it. And by the time we got done with it, it had all these pipes and air hoses coming out of it. And I looked at it and said, guys, why don't we just make this out of PVC to begin with? And we'll make a concrete base anchor and have everything clip into the riser. And all the guys in manufacturing looked at me and said, well, I, we got this injection molding that we need to do in this finished product. I said, no, the installer understands schedule 40. We can discharge and hold all the parts on something that we already need. We can get rid of half of this plastic. We can reduce our total output of waste in this plant right here by getting rid of it. So we made this cool kit where everything is snapped together and we use these little clips uh, that screw into the riser and you drop the pieces into the tank and the tubes clip right in there and they're weighted bases and the whole unit just stays like that. You plumb your top pieces to your air vent into your union on your discharge and you're done. That's what it looks like. And you can see the little three hole snap guides at the top. Okay, that's pretty much just the side view of the same thing. You can see where the emergency storage is and where the floats are and how the siphon works. And again, that's a sealed baffle wall. I wanted to talk about this real quick before we move on to the Presby part of the presentation. Uh, this is something that we have now called Grease Guardian. And it is the other problem that we see at Anua is grease traps really don't work. And they're nasty and they're out in the parking lot. And when you pump them at a restaurant, they stink and it's really bad. So. We developed this unit through FM Environmental in Ireland uh, that sits under a three bay sink. Um, we actually have a, yard, a large unit that can go in the basement of a restaurant that will actually remove all of the grease uh, at the process point and put it in that collection cup so that you can give it to a render and get some money back instead of calling your pumper. So this is available. It removes 99% of the grease from the waste stream before it even hits the sewer line. Uh, it's a really cool thing if you're dealing with restaurants or high strength waste and you wanna get the grease out and uh, it, it is a really, really cool unit. NutriQuad is something else that we developed. It's an organic chemical that neutralizes quaternary ammonia in restaurants. All of our research led us to believe that quaternary ammonia, ammonia used in restaurants, and I say that because there's a ton of restaurants around here, uh, really in, uh, inhibits the nitrogen reduction part uh, of any process system. So places that aren't using chlorine, that are using quaternary ammonia, you know, that are usually provided by uh, Cisco or the, the restaurant provider that they're doing their dishes from, this will neutralize that and allow the nitrogen reduction numbers to jump up. Great.
Anybody have any questions? If you have an existing septic tank, you could use that and put right next to it, we'll say a four to six bedroom is usually a 500 gallon reactor tank. You could put in a reactor tank right next to it. As long as that septic tank is in good shape, it's good to go. And we actually have that in our manual and shows how you would do a retrofit of that nature. Mm -hmm. I, I would say shut down, yes. I mean, it is low energy usage, and it's only going to keep that bacteria, like I said, the aerator will probably run, if you add it all the time, 30 to 40 minutes a day. But why bother wasting the electricity in my mind? The reactor chamber is going to pump itself dry on the last discharge, and all you're going to have is whatever settled waters in your septic tank, which is designed to handle it in the cold. The SBR is better than 5 and 5 TSS and BOD uh, with a 70% nitrogen reduction, and we're better than 2 and 2 on uh, pure flow for TSS and BOD. So, and both products are NSF 40, the SBR is NSF 245. The pure flow system to be NSF 245 compliant needs to be in a recirculation mode. Uh, a lot of times, what we see is the two technologies coupled together uh, where you might want superior effluent and you would use the peat modules at a higher loading rate in what we call polishing mode so we have a bunch of that and again be more than glad to help anyone with their designs uh, and share our tools our cad tools anything you guys need uh, our government relations department is great colin our president is uh, uh, an ex-regulator from the state of arizona uh, he's worked for various companies in that position as uh government relations and president, and he's, he's really good. That one you're going to have to check with me after because I have to go to the guide because New York is completely different than any other state, and that's because of the 75A compliance. So off the top of my head, but I do have the chart. And actually, if, I, if you don't have the chart, I have them actually with me today. So I can give you the application rate based on New York for 75A. Now, I will say for repair replacement, though, we just did uh, communicating with Glens Falls. And with the justification of, of Kaplan and things that we have been doing in every other state other than here, they had zero qualms about complying with that and stepping away from the New York 75A model. So I think the science leaves people to be receptive if they're approached in the correct way uh, because we have lots of research in that, that realm for repair replacement. So I can actually share both tables with you and kind of give you the justification. Cool, so I get to talk about two technology. Oh, go ahead. One per bedroom. One per bedroom. We made it easy on the math. <laughs> that would probably cost you 350 bucks though, because that took two minutes, that's an hour. All right, so one of the companies that, that are in my portfolio uh, is Morningstar Distribution, uh, of which Jim Hyman, our uh, sales business manager, is in the back and been manning the booth all day. Uh, and it's a company that I kind of started out with when Presby was very early on. And throughout all of our acquisitions, uh, you know, Presby, we, we've stayed with it because it's a, it's a great technology and it doesn't really conflict with anything that I just talked about. Because these are all individual tools and that is the important uh, thing. There's lots of technology. There's, there's Elgin, there's Claris, we've talked about everything. These places all have a space that they will need to be used because it is the right technology and the right thing to use. And that's the great part of this whole thing is I get to be challenged how to keep you guys awake for an hour at the end of the day after we're all in carb coma from lunch. 
And we got to keep it interesting. So we got to understand why these things are different, why they're important, and why everybody that spoke here today had something important to say. And that's the cool part. So Presby. Presby is a completely passive gravity unit. And they deal with some of the, uh, and it patented some of the problems that I've talked about uh, that actually make a gravity system work properly. It was invented by this guy who remotely looks like Santa Claus. He, uh, he has been in this industry, I think about 50 years right now. He owned an install company like I did, started out as a pumper, worked for his dad. Uh, and then he also realized that something different needed to happen because there's too many people selling a magic box out of their garage. And this guy really worked hard and through a lot of people that thought he was crazy uh, to prove the science behind this and get the testing and do something completely different. So he's a great, great guy, very knowledgeable. System overview, we have a series of treatment pipes of which we call the system, uh, the advanced enviroseptic in a serial platform and you can see they're end to end. We can do them in a distribution box format, but we prefer not to, and I'll explain why in just a little bit. It has to do about how we were talking about that. How do we deal with gravity correctly without short-circuiting the system? Here's a whole bunch of states and countries that it's approved in. Pretty sure in this room all we care about is New York. Okay, so how does this thing work? We have a layer, uh, we've, we have a pipe, and in the pipe are some perforations and ridges. Those ridges allow us to have the structural capacity to be H20 loading, and we do have some systems in the Catskills that are paved over under parking lots because they didn't have any space. And since it doesn't need any service or a maintenance contract, the DEP allowed us to put them under the parking lots after the, the flood in the Hudson and everything they were dealing with a few years ago because there, a lot of erosion had happened at these restaurants. They didn't want to shut the business owners down, so we had to find a space to put it. Then we've got some green grass, and we have a white fabric underneath there. Uh, and Jim, can you actually grab one of the... Thanks, bud. As the water comes in, we've got a little low vent. You can see right there. And then the system is tied to the high vent at the top of the house. So air is actually naturally coming in from low to high due to Bernoulli's theorem. And we're actually sucking water in. But as water's filling up in the pipe, it's pushing out gas into the sand and evacuating the pipe, which is what we want. Thanks, bud. And as it's receding, it sucks air in through the low vent and continues to increase the CFM. So that's why we use cereal because the drain pipe is at the top, the invert. So we're filling up that entire row and getting hydraulic capacity. We're breathing like the lungs uh, before we go to the next pipe. So we're only using the section of the system that we want to. And because we're constantly using that, we already have the bacteria in here to seed the next pipe should we need to. So we've got some randomized green fabric in here and we've got this cool white stuff. This is how we get out of the distribution uh, conundrum of how do you move water around. Distribution box is great. How many people in here have seen a perfectly level distribution box in the past five years? Anyone? I haven't. It, it is the day you put it in. But how do we know each line is actually getting the water it's supposed to be getting? We don't. So let's design the first pipe to take the entire load of the house. Let's overrate our loading capacity and make this easy. This is a uh, semi-permeable uh, white fabric that we call the bioaccelerator. Once it's wet, it holds 80% of the water. So it actually wicks the water down the entire length of the pipe. Because uh, if we all know, if you've got a uh, four inch schedule 40 pipe with a bunch of holes in it, we dump, put it 20 feet here on sawhorses and I dump a bucket of water in it, it's gonna go about two feet it's going to fall out the holes and never get to the other end of the pipe. So part of it is how do we use the whole pipe without using electricity? Came up with this idea. It's actually cool because once we pulled this out of the ground and testing over in Europe, we started to learn about masking, which is 
what Tyler and Converse is based on. It's, they basically said that this stone bed needs to be this big. And Jerry Tyler said, all right, if I take a handful of stones and throw them on the ground, 50% of what I just did is absolutely useless because it's blocked by the infiltrative surface. It is not available for bacteria growth. So we need to size this thing so that it's monstrous. But once we started to understand clean water and the long-term acceptance rate of soil and clean water, we started to understand that we could downsize this. But masking, uh, it was pretty evident we did testing because we were growing our bacteria here also. Uh, kind of like we talked about with the Elgin system earlier, we're growing our, our bacteria, our biomat right here on the non-woven geotextile. We're seeding it by the bacteria that's growing on the white part. When we stripped this out after testing, everywhere it contacted these ridges on the pipe was as white as the day it came out the factory. And that's when we all looked at each other and said, well, that, I mean, that's basically it. You're not getting bacterial growth anywhere where fabric is touching anything. And that's why the important part of the product is this green fiber, because it keeps this spaced away and allows us to grow more bacteria on both sides of this and keep it out of the C33 concrete sand that we're bedding it in. So that was kind of a cool situation. Also, you see these little doodads in here. We call these skimmer tabs. They're, when we punch out the perforations, we purposely leave these in here. Uh, there was some talk earlier from Mr. King about uh, how pilings rot only at the water level. It's the same thing with a mailbox. When you see a mailbox rot halfway up, it always rots at the ground because it's wet dry cycles, wet and dry cycles. So the easiest way to deal with grease and fats and other things is to constantly be wetting and drying them. So as things travel through the pipe, those strands of grease and whatnot, and I'll show you some pictures, wrap themselves around these skimmer tabs and allow themselves to be suspended so they can get broken down with more airflow above the water that's being treated. So that's actually done on purpose. We all know how this works. We were talking about how water is only going to come out in an anaerobic system in the first few feet till all the air and soil is used up and then the ground won't take any more water and the water will move on to the next two feet until it uses up the entire bed. That is how conventional weight, uh, water treatment has worked in the past. And then that's what happens at the end of the day. So by keeping all of that biomat close to the pipe where it can continually be eaten by other bacterias, that's the cool part. Microbial assimilation, once again. Oxygen, food and water, which we talked about, which happens with wet and dry cycles, and surface area are the most important things to water treatment. That's why we wanted to maximize both sides of the pipe and allow us to have this spaced out so we can grow bacteria uh, anywhere that we want to without getting it into the receiving surface. C33 concrete sand, uh, we actually have a tool because uh, the other thing that we've started to learn is that if you process and manufacture C33 sand, and as we do in New York, it gets cold and you can't process it in the winter, so you stockpile it. We started to realize testing things, especially in the cat skills, as those piles sit there and freeze and thaw all winter, the fines start to move down and concentrates change inside the sand that's available at the sand pit. So we created a little tool that you can take the load and do a sieve test in seven minutes and it says go, no, go. This is good sand, it will work. This is bad sand, tell the guy to take it back. So that's available through our distributors also. That was my fence post analogy, but Jim stole it. So I liked his better because it was in the water. It looked cool with that little island in the back. Okay. That's what the pipe looks like in operation. This was a pipe after six months of testing, 300 gallons per day for six months uh, in Sibido, which is uh, in Denmark. 
we flew the pipes back and you can see absolutely how clean that pipe is and 300 gallons a day every day day in day out that was the picture that kind of shows the masking And that's our NSF 40 testing data. Again, better than two and two TSS and BOD with very low fecal coliforms. And I think that ties into everything that has been said with sand all the way up to George Hufelder's talk earlier today. Sand does a lot of heavy lifting and you can reduce a lot of things with it. The key is reducing the amount of mass that you have to use because a giant above ground sand mound makes the spousal acceptance factor of my green lids look like a Mercedes. So the key is really how little sand can you use? How little resource can you use and get the same amount of treatment? This is testing in New Zealand that we were doing two years ago. That's water actually from the system at uh, influent of 300 TSS and BOD. That's the output from the pipe. And yes, we did use a pump to pump the water up from the bottom of the, the membrane. I wanted to show you this. This is the waste treatment plant for the town of Sunapee in, in uh, New Hampshire. 80,000 gallons per day system uh, that treats the entire town water. They used to have an operator, two guys that worked there full time when it was an amphidrome plant. Uh, now I think the guy sits around three days a week and we're not sure what he does the other two but he's very happy and the guy's smiling every time we show up to look at it. and i think it's probably because he works about five hours a week now but it's been a great system that's been in for five years we do a lot of testing on that it's a few miles down the road from the factory they do have distribution boxes. yeah because that's a huge system and they're all pumped and monitored so we kind of zoned it out in case there was ever we kind of thought you know, how would you think building a plant like a plant operator with something that you, you could just do one field? But we applied kind of what we know is how we could zone it. So if we ever needed to re, you know, if we ever got a bad load, so to speak, how could we contain it? Okay, I got one last thing I'm going to show you. It's going to take two seconds. It's pretty cool. This is a new product that we just developed. It's called Iosite. Uh, it is the price of a phone dialer. It non-destructively plugs in to every advanced treatment system, period, and will fully or pump station, and will fully monitor the entire health of the system. It will give you information of daily water usage using the pumps as a cycle counter. It will send you emails when your pumps are down or your aerator is not working. And it is the first product on the market that has an algorithm for predictive maintenance. It takes snapshots of the pumps and aerators every time they operate. You input the standard working load on the back with the pump curve into the unit when you set it up. And it starts monitoring that pump, how long it's run, what amperage and voltage it's run at. And if it thinks it's going to break in 30 days, it sends you an email and lets you know. Because a lot of times something might be clogged in there and you wouldn't know. As soon as that amperage goes outside what the algorithm deems as a properly operating pump, it starts telling you how many minutes. It's been an overload. And we'll send you an email saying, hey, a non-flushable wipe in there. You might want to get that pulled out. And it's cool because you don't have to cut any wires. It just clamps over the wires and it starts logging uh, daily water usage in perpetuity, not 4,000 events on a server in per perpetuity that can be downloaded to Excel and any document. It can work with aerators, pump stations, uh, and every we've had it plugged into Norwecos, Jets, just about everybody's system, and we've had great success. Uh, it has an app for your iPhone, your Android. It works on your laptop, gives you great information, shows you real-time stuff. For us engineers, it logs data about site visits, when it was serviced, 
Uh, it records how much water they've actually used uh, versus how much water the system was designed for. You can load the DWG files into the customer file. You can have install pictures loaded in here. If you get lost, it's got Google Maps. It'll take you right to the house. And it logs everything. The cool thing that it logs is every time this one's connected to an SBR, one of ours. So it actually monitors the aerator and says, hey, the aerator operated the entire time it was supposed to at the correct amperage and voltage for the correct amount of time. That water is clean. And if it doesn't do that, this unit shuts the system down. So that way, if we're doing water reuse in California where we're going to irrigate or we're going to wash dishes with it or flush toilets, we want to know what's going on. So, wow, this is fancy and great. The cool part is it costs less than an Elderon phone dialer. And that's the key part of it. It's affordable. And it's a one, two, three step process. You take a picture of the box with your phone. It loads the data for that unit. You type in the customer's information, you hit enter, and you walk away. Because as an installer, and I have a bunch of guys, we still own an install company, these guys all get our products first. So when I get one guy looking at me like this, I have to think about, did I design the right product? So we really designed this for anybody to put in. Now, I have not had my mother try to install it yet, but I will, and I'll let you know how we do. Feel free to contact me. Thanks for staying awake. Thanks for having me. Thanks to Lake George for doing this because this is great. Appreciate it. Thank you.